good old tape as it is in person. It's a done deal. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning at verse 7. We'll read through verse 17. And if we would stand tonight in honor of the reading of God's Word, the primary text this evening reads, tonight I'm reading from the King James, Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offerings for sin thou wouldest not, neither hast pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all, three words, once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Actually, I'm sorry, I read through verse 18. Amen. Master, we thank you, God, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We ask now that the bread of life would receive that great and wonderful anointing of the Holy Ghost, God, that it might reach into the very depths of our soul and bring about some change, Lord, that you would desire. God, that you would challenge us, encourage us, build our faith this hour, God, with your word. Help us to feast, Lord, on this manna from heaven tonight. And God, help me to be effective in delivering the message that you've laid upon my heart for this moment in time. For we ask it all in Jesus' precious name. <clears throat> amen. God bless you. you. may be seated. And amen. The wonderful miracle of Calvary is that God loved the world so much that he literally offered himself in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary as payment for the debts of all the world. Not just for those who would believe, but also for those who would not believe. Not just for those who would love him in return, but also those who would reject and scorn him. Paul tells the Hebrew church in verse 10 of our primary text, that the body of Christ was offered once for all. Amen. Not just for some, but for all. There is no need anymore for a daily sacrifice, Paul says, even as the Catholic doctrine and practice of the sacrifice of the Mass, the daily reliving and acting out of Calvary's sacrifice. There is no need for this, for the body of Christ was offered once, and for all. This fact may trouble some who would hear this message today. After all, there are some within our community whom others have placed outside the boundaries of grace and beyond the limits of the blood of Calvary. There are those today whom some would say cannot be saved, should not be saved. But my friend, I'm here to tell you without fear of contradiction that there is not a soul in this room or a person on this planet who cannot be saved if they will simply hear, believe, and obey this wonderful gospel message. 
They may not meet your concept or perception of holiness before or after their conversion, but in the end it is neither you nor I who will make the call as to whether those believers will make heaven or not. Amen. The Word of God declares in Romans 14 verses 1 through 5, Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despiseth him that eat not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth, yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. So the bottom line today is that it's our responsibility to be persuaded in our own mind and to know what we believe and to have our own convictions. Paul said there's going to be differences. There are going to be those who believe one way and those who believe the opposite way. He said that's all right, just let it go. It's not... It's not important. If God has received him, God has received him. Said so the reality, you know, there are some people that believe they can be gay and be saved. You know what? That's all right. Let them be. If God's received them, God's received them. Amen. It's not your job to second guess it or judge it. Amen. Amen. There are two great truths that we find in our primary text tonight. The first of which is this. Jesus Christ sacrifice on the cross of Calvary was offered once. It need never be repeated. There now remains no more offering for sin. The offering of Jesus Christ on Calvary was sufficient. There is absolutely no need for another offering. There is not another offering you could possibly produce that could add to the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. Now, the Roman Catholic Church, with their doctrine of the Mass, in their doctrine, they literally claim that the elements are magically transported into the literal body and blood of Christ. That's the claim of their doctrine, transubstantiation. Now, according to the Roman Catholic doctrine of the Mass, every time the priest says the Mass, he is literally repeating the sacrifice of Calvary over and over and over again so that around the world there are hundreds of thousands of priests every day who do this more than one time a day so that the sacrifice of Calvary, according to their doctrine, is repeated millions of times a day around the world. The Lord is crucified millions of times a day. But the Bible said He was crucified once and for all. It is not necessary. And, and the writer, Paul, even goes into detail talking about the priest and how the priest comes in and offers a daily sacrifice. He says this is no longer necessary. That's why in the New Testament we have pastors, we have bishops, we have deacons, we have elders, we don't have priests. Because a priest is one who oversees a sacrifice. And there is no sacrifice remaining. There is no more sacrifice for sin. Amen. That's what Paul said in our primary text tonight. The enemy... Let me see here. Hebrews 10 verses 22 through 27. Let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. 
and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as ye see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. My Lord, that's heavy duty. You know, most churches don't get into this. Most churches will ignore this passage of Scripture. They'll, they'll try to make it out like, you know, water it down and dilute it. But Paul finishes by saying, But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. Here, Paul, my friend, is not talking about conduct. Paul's not talking about the way believers behave. He's talking about what you believe. He says, if you, after you have come into the knowledge of one God in Christ, and Jesus is his name, after you've been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, after you've received the gift of the Holy Ghost, if you then somehow find your way back into a state of unbelief so that you no longer believe this message and you completely give up on this gospel, Paul says, honey, you are lost without hope because there is no way on earth you can sacrifice Christ a second time. It can't be done. That's why it's so important today that you hold on to your faith with everything that you've got. That's why it's so important today that you know what you believe and you believe what you know. That's why it's so important today that this preacher gets up and talks about the fact that this is why Paul says, forsaking not the assembling of yourselves together. See, because it plays a part in helping to keep you where you need to be so you don't lose out with God. The enemy of your soul wants to make you believe that you don't need church. It isn't necessary for you to have a pastor. But my friend, I'm here to tell you today that this lie is from hell and it's designed to weaken you, to leave you vulnerable to the attacks of the enemy against your soul. He knows that he can separate you from God's people and the hearing of God's word that he can much more likely conquer you. Bible said, Satan like a roaring lion, roams to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. That's how lions hunt. They seek out the weak or infirmed, and they separate them from the herd to pounce on them and to devour them. That's how lions hunt. So you see, if you're going to keep your faith intact and if you're going to win this race, you better stay close to the pack. Amen. You better know you do need the church. You better know you do need the house of God. You better know you do need the, uh, the preaching of the word of God. You do need a pastor. You do, you do need someone who has taken on the responsibility, which is a huge and great and heavy responsibility, to be a shepherd of your soul. And while we're all the sheep of God, those of us that God has called to a position of shepherding, that's a heavy-duty responsibility because now we're watching out for people's salvation. We're trying to make sure people stay close to the pack and they stay safe and they don't wind up somewhere they don't need to be. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6. Listen to this now. Talk about scriptures that some churches don't even like to look at. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance. It's impossible. Seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open 
shame. You can't do it. See, you cannot crucify Jesus a second time. The offering was made once and for all. It was done once, and my friend, once that offering has been applied to your life, it need not ever be reapplied. But at the same time, you better make sure you keep yourself in a position of faith and confidence in God and conviction. Because there are too many that run around. Now I want you to understand, we're not talking, I don't believe for two seconds the Lord is speaking about what we would call folks who backslide. People who backslide many times, they do so, their conduct slips, they start doing things they wouldn't otherwise do, what have you. That doesn't mean that their faith has failed. That just means that their ability to do the right thing has failed. It doesn't mean that their faith has failed. They still believe, a lot of them, what they always believed. Okay, a lot of those folks still have faith and confidence in Jesus Christ. A lot of those folks still, their faith is intact, but they just are weak in the flesh, and they're not able to fight that spiritual battle so that the Spirit wins over the flesh. So this is not what the Lord's talking about, but He's talking about those who literally fall into a state of unbelief. The same state we were in before we were saved. The Lord said, no, if you go there, you're on your own. Because there is no more sacrifice. The sacrifice was made once and for all. Paul's warning to the Hebrew church has nothing to do with the manner in which people live their lives. God clearly knows that in this life we win some battles of the spirit over the flesh and we lose some with the flesh winning over the spirit. One does not at all easily forfeit their salvation, but it can be done. I didn't say it's easy, but it can be done. Paul warns the Hebrews that if they begin by believing this gospel and embracing the Lord Jesus Christ, only to later allow themselves to fall back into a genuine state of unbelief, it is not possible to apply the sacrifice of Calvary a second time to the life of that one whose faith has failed them. That's why the Bible teaches us to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. What does Paul say? We've got to fight with all our might to keep intact our faith. Because that's what's going to be a do or die. That's what's going to be a live or die decision. Number two today, the second wonderful truth shared with us in our primary text this afternoon is Jesus Christ not only died once, but Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary for all. Jerry Falwell may not like this idea. Pat Robertson may be repulsed by this notion. Jimmy swaggered, ignoring his own faults and focusing in on the perceived sins of others, may not be willing to recognize this truth, but it remains nonetheless true. Hallelujah! He didn't just die once, he died for all! For all! Hallelujah! There are no exceptions. John 3, 15 through 17 that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Praise God. Not only did he die once, Mother, but he died for all. Whosoever will may come. Luke chapter 12, verses 4 through 9. And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings, and not one of them is forgotten before God? 
but even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Also I say unto you, whosoever, he died not just once, but also for all, whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. But he that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. Amen. Some attempt today to suggest that there is yet mediation going on in heaven on behalf of those of us who believe. This is a false notion and a hideous doctrine which has given birth to other heresies such as the intercession of Mary, the intercession of the saints on behalf of God's people. Jesus prayed for each and every one of us as he knelt in the garden of Gethsemane. You remember when the Lord prayed in Gethsemane, he said, and Father, I pray not only for these, meaning his disciples and apostles, he said, but for all them who would believe because of their testimony. That's you and me. The Lord is praying for us. We don't need another mediator. We don't need another intercessor. We have all the mediation and all the intercession that we possibly could ever need. You see, the Bible said in 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. There's only one mediator between God and man. But here's the problem, Mother. People read that verse and they say, well, he's still mediating. No, he isn't. He already mediated. What this verse is, what Paul's trying to say is, there was only one person who ever stood in the position where they were qualified to act as a mediator between God and humanity, and that is the man, Jesus Christ. But mediation is when someone goes in representing the greater body in order to negotiate the terms of a contract. Haven't you ever heard about uh, unions? And they have mediators who go in and they negotiate with the uh, management in order to, to develop a contract. Now those people aren't there of their own accord. They're not there for their own business. They're not there on, uh, uh, in their own interest. They are there representing every single member of that union. Every single person that is going to be affected by that contract. Well, I've got news for you. Jesus Christ mediated the contract. He paid the price. The contract is completed. When he said on the cross of Calvary, it is finished. The contract he had mediated was complete. It's done once and for all. Hallelujah. Never again to be repeated. Glory to God. Some try to point to the biblical statement found in Romans 8.34. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. But intercession and mediation are two completely different transactions. A mediator is one who represents for the purpose of establishing the terms of a contract or agreement. One intercedes when they appear on your behalf in time of trouble or distress, seeking aid or assistance. The truth today, my friend, is this. Jesus Christ wants you and I to succeed. He wants you to keep your faith intact. He wants you to be saved and make heaven your home. He has already mediated the terms of the contract. He has already fulfilled those terms on Calvary's cross. And now he stands in the gap for you and I. And every time we lose strength and appear to be in need of divine assistance, he is interceding on our behalf. We don't need old Mother Mary. We don't need the saints 
glory to the Lamb of God. We have Jesus Christ himself as our intercessor. Some would say, well, but does at this point to God be in two people? If Jesus Christ, the man, is our intercessor, I told you, his job is not done till the church is redeemed. That human form is not done with until the church is redeemed. So it is still that there's still a job that that man is serving in heaven at the moment while that body is standing and sitting at the right hand of the throne of God says he can't sit in the throne of God. Why? Because God is not a man. So he cannot sit in the throne of God, but he's sitting beside at the right hand of the throne of God for a time until the Bible said, I make all your enemies your footstool. Remember? Yes. And he says, but I want you to listen to me now. Here's how that intercession works. <laughs> this is exciting. Even as Abel's blood cried out to God after his brutal murder at the hands of his brother Cain, God said, Cain, what have you done? Because I hear your brother's blood crying out to me. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> Even so today, the blood of Jesus Christ continues to cry out through the ages for God's help and grace in our every moment of trial. Oh, hallelujah. I was spilled upon this ground of Golgotha so that this person might be saved. Oh, Lord, don't let anything push them out of the divine way so that my being shed for them should be in vain. That's what the blood says throughout eternity to God. That's how the man Jesus Christ continues to intercede for us because his blood cries out from the ground of Calvary. Glory to God throughout all of time until this thing comes to a glorious conclusion. You think it's an accident that God included the telling of the story of Cain and Abel and that God included the fact that his blood cried out. Where's the life? It's in the blood. The Bible said the life is in the blood. The Bible said without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sins. It is in the blood that all our salvation and our hope lie. And God is telling you today, children, yes, he is still ever interceding for us, but not as one person before another person, but rather as the person that he was who shed his blood on the cross of Calvary. That blood to this day continues to cry out to God on behalf of you and me. Hallelujah. Whew. My friend... God knew 25 billion years ago that you would be exactly where you are right now. Those that will one day watch this video, God knew billions of years ago where you'd be right this minute. He knew before the foundations of the earth were laid that you would be sitting in this place or that you would be listening to this message by cassette tape or on the internet. And today you have the opportunity to not only hear this wonderful good news, Christ died once and for all, but also you're able to respond to this message and be saved. Please do not let this divinely appointed opportunity pass you by. Don't let this opportunity pass you by. You've heard it as plain as anyone could tell it. Jesus Christ died once and for all. You say, Brother Morrow, I can't be saved because of who I am. That's a lie from hell. I'm telling you, Jesus Christ died once and for all. I've told you from the scriptures today, it's not important what your mama thinks. It's not important what your daddy thinks. It's not important what your neighbor thinks or what Sister Fatso in the church down the road thinks or what Pastor Jones over here thinks or what Pastor Smith over there thinks. What's important is what you think. Paul said, let every man be convinced in his own mind. And if you can understand tonight, 
that this matter is settled in heaven for eternity. Jesus Christ died once and for all. Hallelujah. You are in that number. <laughs> Oh, hallelujah. You know, all isn't even a number, but it is a number. <laughs> because it's like, well, there's one more, okay, then it's included. Oh, hallelujah. Here's one more of them, and he's included. Lord, there's 30 over here, they're included. God, there's a thousand over here, they're included. Well, Lord, how many are in all? As many as the Lord our God shall call are in all. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So I hope tonight that was the word of encouragement for you. Amen. Isn't that exciting? And what a wonderful thought to know that the blood of the Lamb continues to intercede on our behalf today. Amen. Master, we thank you, God, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for this message. We thank you, God, for the wonderful presence of the Holy Ghost that we feel in this place. God, your word is exalted above all else this hour. The grass withers and the flower fades, but your word will stand forever. And God, we put our confidence in your word. We believe you. We trust you. You said it was done once and for all, and we believe you. And every lying devil from hell that would try to tell us, God, that we're not included, we're not part of this thing, we're not included in this thing, in the name of Jesus, we rebuke that old lying devil. Because, Lord, if we can believe this, we can be included. Oh, Master, today, there are going to be many that will hear this message on tape. There are going to be many, God, that will hear it on the Internet. There will be many, God, that might see the video we pray this hour, that they would hear the Acts 2.38 message. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promises unto you and your children, to them that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And that includes you and I today. Help us, Master, today to be a soul-winning church. Help us, God, to reach the lost. God, I don't care if we ever see one person come into this church that's ever gone to church a day in their life. If there are unbelievers out there that need to find the truth, Master, in Jesus' name, help us to find them. And help us, Lord, to bring them into this place that they might be saved, that they might be set free, that they might find the liberty that exists only in serving you. Oh, great Jesus, we ask this tonight in the wonderful, lovely, precious name of our Lord, our Savior, our God, our soon-coming King, Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise God and amen.